Your Excellencies, members of IFIMES Council, member, members of IFIMES, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Thank you all for coming and welcome. International Institute for Middle East and Balkan Studies, IFIMES from Ljubljana, as organizer of today's event, is honored to welcome distinguished guest, His Excellency Dr. Stevo Pendarovsky, President of the Republic of North Macedonia. Special regards goes to His Excellency Stepan Mesic, former President of the Republic of Croatia and Honorary President of Institute IFIMES. His Excellency Stevo Pendarovsky is President of the Republic of North Macedonia since 12 May 2019. His key commitments as the President of the Republic of North Macedonia are to be the President of all citizens, to support political dialogue, to be available and in constant communications with citizens. President Pendarovsky believes that the function of the President of the State is not only the highest function according to the Constitution. Being a President means uniting, not dividing, encouraging togetherness and mutual understanding. Being a president means courage and determination to make difficult decisions, to be the pride of the citizens. The president connects all citizens who live in the country, works for the citizens, serves his people expertly, honestly, and fairly connects citizens regardless of their ethnic, religious, social, or other original. In his lecture, President Dr. Stevo Pendarovsky will talk about current developments in North Macedonia since coming to power, setting a date for the start of negotiations with the European Union and the future of North Macedonia, which is linked to regional and neighborly cooperation and membership in the European Union and NATO. The lecture will be delivered in English and will be followed follow by a discussion with the guest lecturer uh, moderated my, by myself and my colleague Bakhtiar Aljev. Počitovani predsedatelj Dr. Stevo Pendarovski, vaše excelenci, členovi na Sovetot, Sovetodavniot odbor in členovi na Međunarodniot institut IFIMES, dami i gospoda, počitovani učesnici na denešnjoto predavanje i si te drugi koji ne sledet preku internet. Dozvolite mi najprvo da ve pozdravim i da vi se zablagodaram što vo tolka broj se odzvavte za denešnjeto predavanje na predsedatelot na Republika Severna Makedonija dr. Stevo Pendarovski na tema i dnina na Republika Severna Makedonija kako da se ubrza integracija ta vo Evropska unija. Denešnjot nastan očigledno kažuva deka nije sedno za toa što se slučava vo Severna Makedonija i vo regionot. Počitovani predsedatelj Pendarovski, dobro dojdovete vo IFIMES i vo Slovenija. Spoštovani predsednik dr. Pendarovski, vaše ekselencije, člani sveta, svetovalnega odbora in člani mednarodnega inštituta IFIMES, dame in gospodje, spoštovani udeleženci današnjega dogodka, vsi, ki nas premljate prek spleta. Dovolite mi, da vas najpej pozdravi in se zahvalim, da ste se odzvali našemu povabilu na današnji dogodek, predavanje njegove ekselence, profesora dr. Steve Pendarovskega, predsednika Republike Severne Makedonije. Spoštovani predsednik dr. Pendarovski, dobrodošli na IFIMES. Njegova ekselenca dr. Pendarovski je predsednik Republike Severne Makedonije od 12. maja tega leta, rojen je leta 63 v Skopju, diplomirao je leta 87 na Fakulteti pravne in politične vede na Univerzi Sveti Cirili Metod v Skopju, magistrirao in doktorirao na Inštitutu za sociološka in polično pravna raziskovanja pri Univerzi Sveti Ciril in Metod. Njegovi ključni povdarki kot predsednika države so, da bo predsednik vse državljano, da bo podpiral polični dialog in da bo dostopen in v stalnem dialogu z državljani. V svojem predavanju bo govoril o aktualnih dogajanji in o prihodnosti Severne Makedonije na poti k Evropski uniji in NATO, ter o tem, kako pospešiti pot te države v Evropsko unijo in kako okrepiti regionalno in sosedsko sodelovanje. Pripričan je, da je funkcija predsednika države ni samo najviša funkcija po ustavi, biti predsednik po meni zediniti, ne deliti, podpirati jedinstvo in medsebojno razumevanje, biti predsednik po meni imeti pogum in dostojanstvo 
za težke odločitve, pomeni biti ponos državljanov, predsednik povezuje vse državljane, dela za državljane, služi svojemu narodu strokovno, pošteno in pravično, povezuje državljane, ne glede na njihovo etnično, versko, socialno in drugo poreklo. Še enkrat dobro došli in predajem vam besedo. Your Excellency, the floor is your. Dva dne. Ja ne bo to vdame. Thank you. I would like, first of all, to thank both of our hosts. It was really a very long introduction, multilingual. And uh, I'm really honored to be today with you. And I would like to, to convey the, the greetings to all the attendees. To this session, I, it is scheduled to speak about for 30 to 20 to 30 minutes, and all in all to have the session with a duration of 60 minutes, but I would, I would try to be as short as possible because I would like to give more room, more space for conversation with you. If eventually, you have some comments, some questions, <coughs> some remarks on what I'm going to say in the next 15 or so minutes. Uh, I would like to say, uh, to, to waste your time speaking about myself, it was really enough what our host already said. Uh, just to say that uh, I'm try to, I will try to cover the period in the past two, two and a half years since we have the new political structure in power in Skopje, in North Macedonia. Uh, in a short, I would say that the recovery of one uh, state seen in North Macedonia in the past two, two and a half years is not seen in post World War II Europe. And uh, these are not the strong words, these are only the correct words. Uh, we, uh, we have succeeded with the support, of course, by the broad number of our citizens to come back from the very brink of the broader civil unrest. We have been uh, described by the European Commission in 2016 report as a capture state. And uh, today we are only a few months away from the full membership in the NATO alliance because we got an invitation last year during the Brussels summit in July. And uh, we are waiting this autumn for the start of accession talks with the European Union for full membership in that association. Probably many of you have seen very ugly scenes from 27th of April in 2017, when the Macedonian parliament was stormed by the angry mob being organized and inspired and managed of that time, that time by the ruling party. And uh, I was at that time the member of parliament, just winning the seats on the fin uh, completed elections in December in 2016. And we have been the subject of brutal attack not seen, not seen for centuries in modern Europe. Then the parliamentary building, the temple of democracy was attacked by the people who allegedly have been angry because of the transfer of power. In essence, that was an attempt by the then ruling party, Vomero de Pomane, to stop, to prevent the transfer of power as the will of the people dictates during the December elections in 2016. So, as I said, we came back from the very brink of the civil unrest, which might shatter the very foundations of the Macedonian state at that time, and started with the profound reforms and transformations of the country. The very few preconditions needed to have better internal cohesion and to stood better chances for Euro-Atlantic integrations have been to resolve the long-standing disputes we have had with our neighbors. In the, first, in the first place, Bulgaria, and after that with Greece. We have signed the agreement on good neighbor relations and friendship with Bulgaria on the 1st of August 2017, established a commission of historians which is still uh, functional, still working. They have held seven sessions up to now in Skopje and Sofia. They have produced some initial results. They have still a lot of work to do, to do but they are on the good path and they have the full support by our government and by myself to proceed along that way. Because before that, our Bulgarian friends have some remarks on some endeavors, some undertakings of the previous government Trying to, trying to present some very controversial historical events and some common historical heroes in, the, in, the, in a manner which was not in line with the known and confirmed historical facts. So we are proceeding well with the Bulgarians in that commission. After that, after very long, very long negotiations with our Greek friends, we have signed the so-called PRESPA agreement or 
to say the longer title of that agreement, the final solution for the name dispute, which started in 1993 with the two UN resolutions from April that year. And we have negotiated for two and a half decades, many suggestions by both sides, by many sides, by the mediator, by Skopje, by Athens have been put on the table. Nothing of that was agreed. And that year in 2018, in July, in June, July period, it took for two courageous leaders in Athens and Skopje, for Zoran Zaev and Alexis Tsipras, to agree on the PRESPA agreement, of course, with the help of the whole teams on both sides. We have signed that agreement, which is equal to political miracle, the dispute, which is unique <coughs> in the human history, at least in the history of modern diplomacy, when one country has urging the other country, its neighbor, to change the name. And on that unique dispute, we have found the unique solution, which in my understanding is not harming the national interests of both sides, of neither side. So with the PRESPA agreement, we finally wide open the door for NATO and for European Union integration. And uh, as I mentioned, we have got that invitation at the Brussels summit in 2017, sorry, 18. And we have assembled up to now 21 uh, accession protocol signatures or approval in the national parliaments, waiting for eight more. And there are all chances to succeed on the 4th of December to become the 30th member of the Alliance at the 17th, 17th anniversary of that organization. Speaking about the European Union, the, the prospects are not so clear, and that has nothing to do with our, with our results and our past record. It has something to do with some, unfortunately, internal infighting in Brussels, when the, the key European countries are still struggling about the future European architecture and are still devoting more time to their internal fighting than to the legitimate desires of the people from the region of the Western Balkan, Balkans to join them. I wouldn't like to miss one uh, project, uh, to mention one project more, apart from these very strategic projects that we have, we have completed with our Bulgaria and Greek friends. That is the so-called law on languages, in translation, a law on the Albanian language, which has been, in essence, the last normative piece of the framework Ohrit Agreement, with which we have concluded our internal conflict in 2001. So with which, by which, by which law we have elevated the status of the Albanian language on the level of the second official language in the country, then apart from Macedonian language. Uh, to be honest, uh, the last endeavor, as was the case with the PRESPA agreement, was not quite easy to be done, because there have been some resistance, among ethnic Macedonians especially, and uh, there was some resistance against the PRESPA agreement as well. At the time when the PRESPA agreement was signed, 17th of July, of June, that we have only 25% of ethnic Macedonians being in favor of that agreement. Today, we are nearing 50% threshold and almost a majority among ethnic Macedonians, uh, counting only ethnic Macedonian uh, votes, not to say anything about the ethnic Albanians who has nothing to do with the core of that problem and has always been 100% in, in favor of that agreement. So slowly but steadily, that agreement is gaining ground and is getting uh, higher and higher approval among our citizens of all ethnic communities. The same goes for the, for the law languages. Uh, my key thesis regarding the law on the Albanian, the so-called law on the Albanian language was that no country in the world has dissolved or has been seriously undermined if you are giving, if you are giving more rights to one ethnic community, uh, community if in the same time you are not taking some rights from the other ethnic community. With this law, we are not taking any linguistic right from the ethnic Macedonians. We are only giving more linguistic rights to the ethnic Albanians. So in my view, that can only strengthen the internal cohesion of the society and universe that can only help our cause to enter European Union and go more easily through all of these negotiations regarding the 35 chapters of that, of that EU path. Uh, I wouldn't like to, to miss uh, the uh, wider regional context in the Western Balkan region where we are situated, and especially would like to devote a, a bit more time to the, to the long-standing quandary over the final year status of Kosovo, and uh, 
probably I'm one of the very rare politicians and, or in, the, in the region and wider on in Europe, unfortunately, who is speaking openly against these latest ideas coming from some corners of our societies or some parts of, of, of uh, Europe or United States of America, speaking again about the swap, swapping the territories and the, and the people and the so-called euphemism correction of the borders, which is nothing, we think nothing more than, than, than advocating for new conflicts in the region. And why is that in my view? It is not only amoral to speak about the correction of the borders in the 21st century in 2019. It is dangerous because during the whole period of dissolution of the former Yugoslavia, there was only one principle in place. Old administrative borders of the former republics, even including the Kosovo, which was the province, not the republic within the federal Yugoslavia, has, has become, when these republics became an independent state, become interstate borders. Then, that was the principle being followed from Slovenian independence after the Kosovo independence. Then, whether that is just correct, it's up to the another discussion. But all that principle was respected without any single exemption. Then, to repeat once more, for everybody to know, then former administrative borders between the republics became, became interstate borders of the newly independent state. With these latest, let's say, thinking or ideas coming from some centers of power, to correct the borders following the ethnic distribution of the population in the region. In essence, those people, those, these centers of power are advocating completely different paradigm which should be implemented on the territory of the former Yugoslavia or in the Western Balkan region, if you like, then instead of former administrative borders to follow the ethnic distribution of the people in the region. That will immediately mean if something like that is executed or came into power, that will mean immediately that the Ohrid Framework Agreement in North Macedonia will go out of power. And that will mean that Dayton Agreement in Bosnia and Herzegovina will not be in power anymore. Why is that? Then let's concentrate, I would like to concentrate on my country. In 2001, we have an internal conflict in which, in short, ethnic Albanians, not being satisfied with the inclusion of the state system, started kind of rebellion against the state, and at the end of that short conflict, the low intensity conflict, in August, the so-called Ohrid Agreement was signed, envisaging a better inclusion of ethnic Albanians in the institutions of the state. The very first demand, that's not to the wider wide public, but being close to the people who have negotiated that, as being the national security advisor of President Boris Trajkovsky at the time, who was in essence the father of that agreement, along with our American and European friends, the very first demand of the so-called Albanian political subject during that negotiations was to establish territorial solutions for the ethnic problems and challenges, meaning kind of an autonomy within Macedonia at that time. That proposal was rejected out of hand, not only by the ethnic Macedonian, the so-called ethnic Macedonian part of the negotiations, but was rejected by the key US negotiator, Ambassador James Pardue, and by the, the key European Union negotiator, former French Defense Minister Lyotard. Lyotard. They said, first of all, Macedonia is so small to be divided, and especially will have big problems to divide the capital in Skopje, which have approximately the similar percent of ethnic Albanians within its city borders, like Sarajevo have Serbs before the Dayton Agreement. So, and in Skopje, in the capital of, of Macedonia, there's the biggest number of Albanians in the country, more than 100,000 people. So if you, for example, give Albanians some territorial autonomy in Tetovo and Gostivar, some western parts of the country, that will not resolve the problem. What about the Albanians in Skopje? And as Ambassador Pardew said, it's not possible to divide the people living in the capital. And secondly, and much more importantly, according to him, he said, we wouldn't like to establish a second Republika Srpska in the heartland of the Balkans, and in essence, to produce another non-functional state. <laughs> Instead of that solution to search for the territorial solutions for the ethnic problems, all negotiators, being on the table in Ohrid, agreed that as a kind of political compensation to enter into the so-called meaningful decentralization, meaning 
to transfer more competencies from the central government to the local municipalities where the Albanians are living in a sizable numbers. And that really happened. That process of decentralization was not only the cosmetic transfer of power to the municipal level. We have at that time 16 municipalities out of 80 in North Macedonia with the Albanian majority. And as a threshold was taken 20% of the people living in the municipal boundaries. Now, putting forward eventually this new paradigm, new principle of following the ethnic distribution of the population or swapping the territories and people because of that. In essence, we should change the former principle of administrative borders with new one and following ethnic principle. And in that very second, the people in Republika Srpska will say we are not satisfied with the data agreement anymore. And the Albanians in Macedonia will say why to stay within the borders of Macedonia when the principle have changed fundamentally. I would like to speak about the possible domino effects for some other areas, maybe Sanjak, maybe Vojvodina and so forth. But that is a very dangerous precedent which might be established. And unfortunately, this principle is mentioned, is elaborated, mainly by the people who have never been in the region, who has never lived in the region, and know, uh, don't know any nuances in the region, and uh, are simply thinking about the future of this region in mechanical terms. For example, what is possible in some other regions and parts of the world? Why not to be possible and implemented in the Western Balkan region? So to make the long story short, in my view, if we start speaking or started, started implementing that kind of ideas, then we will have immediately, but immediately, a series of new conflicts in the Balkan. And instead of speaking about the integration paradigm, integrating our societies, our countries into the European Union and NATO. We'll start speaking again about the so-called hard security agenda from the early 1990s, when we have been speaking only about the borders and about the territorial integrity of our states. That's the reason why I'm strongly and vocally and publicly against that idea. In my view, the borders in the Balkans are where they are. They should stay there. And because it's not possible to have a good solution if you start, if you, if you are taking that road. Uh, speaking, about the, speaking about the possibilities to, to go now to the so-called peaceful agenda, the normal political agenda, about the possibilities, about the chances of, of North Macedonia to start negotiations with the European Union. We have been persuaded by all key European capitals in the past few months that this postponement for autumn, for taking that decision, is only technical that allegedly no political motives are behind that decision to wait, first of all, for the decision of the German Bundestag in September in the session from 27th and 29th of September, and in October to wait for the, for the decision of the European Union as such. What is or might be the cause of concern? My question is, what if some other parliaments will ask for the technical delays out of different reasons? We have new, new governments in the region, mainly in Greece, and some other political changes in the region are not excluded. What's going to be the stance of the new Greek government towards the Prespa Agreement? So in my view, last year, we have a very precise, very plain uh, <coughs> declaration of the European Union on the Sofia summit in June, saying that North Macedonia, and Albania are going to be given date for negotiations next year in June, immediately after the Euro elections are over. Euro elections are over. We are on the very verge of forming new European Union institutions, new European Commission, European Council, and so on and so forth. And they have again delayed our accession or start of accession negotiations out of technical reasons. So we do believe, the words of our friends, that it's only a technical delay. But believe me, not only me, but many common people in my country do not believe, do not believe uh, in the, the, the words of the EU bureaucrats and even politicians after being for so long in the, in the dark transitional tunnel for 30 years. So it is the prime time for the European Union finally to decide on the, on the opening of accession negotiations with the EU. And in my view, it's going to be a great news for the region as well if Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, plus Kosovo, after resolving their status with Belgrade, will start accession talks with the European Union as well. 
unless we have the whole west of the Western Balkans in the European Union, we cannot expect that all Balkan hatreds and uh, sluggish economy, economies, uh, inter-ethnic uh, relations are going to be better. And uh, no one can expect that the young generations who are leaving the region in massive numbers are going to stop. So the biggest at the, moment, at the moment, the biggest threat for national security of all of our Western Balkan societies is the, is the immigration. Young people are, are leaving their fatherlands, their motherlands, leaving for, for, for better life, for higher living standards, for normal life, for, for peaceful life, lives. And if we are not getting into that negotiations with the EU, with the prospects to get there as soon as possible, and as soon as possible certainly doesn't mean that it is seven years, Montenegro is negoti negotiating seven years now, and is still, and is still waiting to, op to open all 35 chapters, and they are very far away from the point that when they will say, we have closed all of these 35 chapters. So in my view, all of that should, should be concluded for all of these countries I have mentioned in our region for five years, five, six years at the maximum. Even after that, we can, we can speak but the new era dawning in the Balkans. Otherwise, we'll be speaking again about, con again about conflicts, about problems, about uh, border skirmishes, about uh, inflammatory rhetoric, as we are seeing the rhetoric coming from some of the Western Balkan region in the past months, when some political leaders speaking that very plainly, they said, if we are not getting a clear European perspective, we will, we will start thinking about unifying the countries or abolishing the borders. So that's the worst possible scenario I can envisage for, for our region. And really the high time for European Union, especially for the key <coughs> members of the European Union, Germany and France, because UK is, uh, on, UK is leaving anyhow, to start thinking about the Balkans and completing that story of integration of the Western Balkan. Otherwise, they will have problems. That's not a threat. We are so small that we cannot be a threat to anybody, especially not to the older European member states. But uh, they will have problems starting from crime, from, from crime and ending with immigration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask Mr. Adaf to start with uh, discussion. Mr. President, we will begin with some questions and then we'll let the public to also to ask. The first, my question is, how did you manage the, to get support of 31 political subjects on recent presidential elections? What's the secret of this success? So uh, I really would like to, to speak again about my presidential campaign. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit unpleasant to speak about myself. It, it is true, it is the correct fact, I got the support of 31 political party. The numbers are maybe impressive, but much more important to me are number of ethnicities, uh, ethnic, ethnic communities who, which supported my candidacy. I can proudly say I can speak about that. Yeah, because I am very proud that I got support virtually from all ethnic communities living in North Macedonia. <coughs> so. That means I got support from the political parties representing ethnic, apart from ethnic Macedonians. Ethnic Albanians, ethnic Turks, ethnic Vlachs, ethnic Bosniaks, and ethnic Serbs. F few others, but these are mentioned in our constitution, and among these 31 political parties which supported my candidacy, at least a half of them are with, with uh, members of different ethnicities in their membership. Uh, I have proposed to all of them one concept, we have named, along with uh, now Prime Minister Zayef at that time, one society for all, and saying that each person in our country has the right to define itself or himself or herself in ethnic or religious terms, in cultural terms, in whatever terms they, they like. But North Macedonia should be equal in approaching them and allowing them to have more rights and to have <coughs> better, better standards of living. So regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their religious beliefs, and regardless of their political or party affiliations. And uh, that was not the joke, but uh, I, I gave one interview for a newspaper from Belgrade, Politica, which is quite unusual for the region we are living in, and saying that I have support of ethnic Albanians and ethnic Serbs in Macedonia. <laughs> Probably no one can say that was simultaneously supported by Serbs and Albanians on any elections in the Western Balkan, <laughs> Balkan region. 
Uh, and I'm really proud of that. I got, I got at the end of, this, of the process in the second round of the elections approximately 440,000 votes, and approximately a quarter of that population came from, the, from, the, from other ethnic communities other than my own ethnic community of ethnic Macedonians. So there's no the secret. You're, I'm speaking plainly to the people and saying that I'm an ethnic Macedonian, but by tradition I'm an Orthodox Christian, but I wouldn't like to, to, to have anything to do with these two of my personal traits when being the president. And up to now, I'm, I'm trying to, be, to stick to my words. Second question is, what is your opinion on national reconciliation in North Macedonia? Your concept is one society for all, as you mentioned now. What will you do to regarding this national reconciliation? No, it's, it's going to be an exaggeration to say that one person everywhere in the world, that one person or one political party or one government or one president can reconcile the people. So these, unfortunately, ethnic hatred and uh, religious divisions are so deep in the whole region of Balkans, then I really do believe that we do need a systemic approach involving many people, state institutions, but most of all, the curriculum in the, in the educational process. And as we start to teach our children from the younger age that all of us are equal to each other, then no one should be, should be taken for granted that because he is the member of some majority, then all of us, including all minorities, not only ethnic and religious, but social minorities as well, have equal, equal rights, then in that country, is not going to be happiness for anybody, is not going to be prosperity, is not going to be internal cohesion, which is fundamental for any progress you can expect. So that is, that is the a long process. That's very strenuous, very, very difficult process. And uh, certainly in this process, you couldn't include uh, nationalists, populists, uh, and people with the ideas that some ethnicities are more worthy than others which is not, which is not uh, a political tradition in the region. But we should, go, we should go against the wind, if you like, to succeed as a region. And finally, to change the perceptions that <coughs> Balkan or Balkanism is something negative. So it's certainly, I'm doing everything possible within my competence, according to the law and the constitution in North Macedonia, to help to contribute to this cause. But I know that uh, my five years of being in office are not going to be enough, certainly, for, to remedy all of these uh, deep divisions being established among us for centuries, for centuries and still, still present, still present. My next question is, till now, nor has the Prime Minister nor the President of uh, the Republic of Northern Macedonia visited Greece. Former Prime Minister Tsipras visited your country in early April. When can we expect your visit to Athens? Oh, I wouldn't like to to discover to the public some of my plans. Something, uh, I'm doing something in this regard. Mm. But because in Greece they have just concluded with the elections, they have the new government, new ministers in place, new prime minister. So probably, and the summer period is approaching. So I, I'm an optimist that I can achieve something in this regard by the end of, or by the end of this year. By the way, uh, your statement is not correct. Uh, Zayv was several times in Greece, but in the private capacity. <laughs> All countries in the region have problems with economic re reconstruction. Most countries have uh, weaker economic indicators than uh, before the collapse of the former common state Yugoslavia. What is the problem of economic reconstruction of the region, including your state of Northern Macedonia? I, I'm not an expert in the field, but just a few theses on that. Uh, I've heard by the people who are more familiar with the subject than me then we are, all of us, we are the small markets. We have the long uh, border procedures. We have a weak administration, not supporting the, the business initiatives of the people. And we are not still, Western Balkan countries, still not part of the wider uh, European market. And uh, up to that point, we'll be struggling with all of these problems to, to make the business in the region when you have only on the territory of former Yugoslavia uh, six or seven borders to pass. So do not, do not forget that we are weak in one other field, maybe not being discussed so thoroughly up to now by any of us. I'm speaking now for my country then. We in North Macedonia has never been living in democracy. 
before 1991, before becoming an independent state. Then you can imagine that's not a joke, but only in 1994, <coughs> one of the political parties being in that, uh, participating in that, in that year elections, have shoot a political advertisement. So we have started to speak about political pluralism than 25 years ago. That's only a second, it's not the second of history, that's a, a millisecond of history. So we are, we are still learning basic democratic lessons. Mm -hmm. And unless there is some kind of, I'm saying quite frequently, external evalu evaluator like Brussels, who will say these are our international or European standards in democracy, in economy, in culture, in administration, in the media, and so on and so forth, we will not be so successful in the short period of time. Just a, a short reminder. Our people, then people in the Western Balkan, have never heard before 1991 about the free press. That term was not known to the common people, not, not known to the politicians as well. We have never heard, believe it or not, about dividing the power into three branches of power. We have the sort of unification of power. We do not have the parliaments. We have sobranie. And uh, we have no political pluralism. We have no economic pluralism. We have, uh, living in the former Yugoslavia, you have some chances, to, if you would like to have some private initiatives in the economy field. And according to the Constitution, then, in the, uh, you, you, you have been entitled to possess, I think, 10 hectares of land. Two apartments or something like that. So no private planes and helicopters. Mm -hmm. So to be a wealthy person was a crime, or almost a crime. People has not been praised if they earn a lot of money. So private initiatives of the people have been stolen and frozen, as simple as by the, by the legislation, by the, by the law, by the, by the constitution. So and all of a sudden, we start teaching people that it's now good to be wealthy, mm -hmm. if all of that goes to the legal ways, of course. And uh, we have still not fostered the generations of young people who are accustomed to that. So whenever you're seeing the, the, the young person in a, in a luxury car, you're saying, oh, he's certainly a drug dealer, <laughs> or kind of a crime, or he's getting a lot of tenders by the government, and so on and so forth. So that general perception should be has to be changed. Otherwise, we'll not have. It's not a crime if you're <coughs> wealthy. And it's not a crime if you have a good, good idea and selling that to the people. People are buying that. It's completely legal. We are still not up to that point. And uh, it's, it seems to me that it's, too, it's still too early. You know, all these democracies we are speaking about, the old democracies, are very old. <laughs> Do not forget, the uh, UK has a parliament established in the 13th century. In North Macedonia, we have established, established a parliament in 1991. So then, we are, still, we are still learning. We are still learning about democracy, and I would like to say that, but it will take a generations, generations to succeed in this regard. <coughs> Otherwise, I cannot see how we can succeed as a society and as a state. Regarding your answer now, the practice is all political parties in the country that wants to become a member of European Union support the European path. How is in your country now political parties? We have one of the highest supports uh, ever recorded in European, in recent European history. In the 90s and in the early 2000s, we have 92 to 95 percent of the people being in favor of NATO membership and European Union membership. It dropped significantly in the period of the former government, Mr. Grievski, and we have been in this period of the time between 60 and 65 percent of the people being in favor of the European Union membership and NATO membership. Now we are back in the old path. So the latest poll polling I saw, 80 to 82 percent of the people from all ethnicities are saying that, yes, we would like to be members in both organizations. But delaying, to go back to your previous questions, yes. delaying the, the accession, opening the accession talks with the European Union is certainly not helpful in this regard. Uh, many people are losing enthusiasm, many politicians are losing enthusiasm. In essence, delaying the membership in the European Union and NATO Western Balkan countries, meaning undermining reform elites, pro-European elites, and pro-Atlantist elites. At the beginning of July, you were in Sarajevo. Often, Bosnia and Herzegovina is compared with your country, for it is multi-ethnicity. How do you see the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and do you see the solution? No. <laughs> 
No, I wouldn't like, I would like to, to appear as a kind of a sage, as a, as a kind of almighty person who knows uh, solutions for all problems. Uh, I'm, it was certainly not uh, good to hear the country being stuck uh, in the same corner for, for years and years and years. I spoke with my uh, Bosnia and Herzegovian friends uh, about their NATO aspirations, and because there is, is a lack of the political consensus for moving towards the NATO alliance towards full membership. Bosnia is a um, mem member of mem a Partnership for Peace program, but that's not enough, that's not membership, of course. And uh, I know that for years, uh, NATO uh, asked from the Bosnian authorities to have the list of all military installations, or the milita inventory of military installations, and to send all of them, including the full territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And they have not done that because in the Republic of Serbska they think that they wouldn't they, they would like to, to rush towards the NATO alliance. And what happened last year when we got the invitation for NATO, uh, NATO for the first time in its history invited Bosnia-Herzegovina to enter into the so-called membership, membership action plan process, which is kind of a waiting room for the full membership, and I asked them to submit a document for the reforms necessary in the security and the defense area in order to become the member one day. <laughs> And uh, I've been informed by my friends in Sarajevo, last time being in that city, that the document is prepared, but because there is the lack of the political will and political consensus from these three constituents in that state, they would like to send that document to the NATO headquarters. So unfortunately, <coughs> without that, they will be still in a limbo, speaking about the hard security issues and speaking about the territorial integrity uh, and speaking about the, the borders still, instead of speaking about the progress in the economic terms, about the living standards. And I've been informed uh, about the results of the latest census being done in that country. Unfortunately, the results are catastrophic. The same goes for the rest of the Balkan, Western Balkan region. Then our countries are emptying simply the young people leaving and not, not looking back. Uh, we have scheduled in North Macedonia, we have scheduled a census for next year for April. And to be honest with you, everybody from, from the politicians to the ordinary people are afraid of the results that might pop up next year because everybody knows that we are certainly not 2.1 million people we used to be in former Yugoslavia. Now, regarding this year's answer, also North Macedonia belongs to the very top of the countries among the first three countries in the world, as I think, according to the percentage of the diaspora, which is over 40%. What's the message of the state to the diaspora, to them? That statistic is certainly not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know why? Because not only Balkan countries, but I know m many countries in the world are boasting about the numbers of their diaspora and saying that they are 10 times higher than the real numbers. And uh, I can tell you that at present, unfortunately, my country doesn't have a precise number of people living abroad. Some numbers are appearing on the surface waiting for the Eurostats <laughs> forums and European Union results or statistics, but we do not know how many people, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, has, has left North Macedonia and living somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, a lot of people are outside. A lot of people are outside. We have included many years ago our diaspora in the election process, and maybe that was not the best of all solutions we might, we might impose. Because... Uh, for example, we have approximately 500 voting stations in our diaspora, and you can imagine we have a lot of people living in Australia and New Zealand, and we have, for example, one polling station in Perth, and, uh, and one person, in order to vote, for example, for the presidential elections in two rounds, should, not, should travel five hours by plane from one to the other part, the side of, of that continent, in order to vote, and certainly no one of us is going to do that. So otherwise, we have offered to our diaspora many times in the past to invest in their country of origin, but results up to now are catastrophic. And it has nothing to do with the diaspora people. It has something to do with the, with the, with the non-solid judicial system with a very slow administration procedures. Uh, in time, from times to times, uh, in some instances, because of the corrupt officials, different levels, central or municipal ones. So all in all, diaspora, I cannot invoke any single positive example from, from the region when diaspora is really involved in something of substance, something of value 
for their motherland. Uh, um, you know, because many people are saying we do not have enough capacities to have an orderly life for the people who stay, who are still living here, and what to speak about the people in the diaspora. So, obviously, the strategy for the for the diaspora in North Macedonia should should has to be has to be changed, and uh, it goes for all other countries in the region. So, as I said, I cannot see any country in the region, even in the wider region of the Balkans, country having a successful. Uh, strategy for for incorporating initiatives of the diaspora into their domestic political life or into their domestic economy. What's your message to neighboring countries, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, Kosovo, and Serbia, and why you choose Slovenia as your first formal visit? Uh, Slovenia is an old friend of Macedonia. So Slovenia has, in my view, executed a disproportionate influence, disproportionate to its size within the European Union and within NATO, disproportionate influence and trying to support our cause to become the member of these two organizations in the past 25 years. So, and even today, uh, our Slovenian friends are one of the most vocal supporters of our ambition to, to get there. And uh, otherwise, I wouldn't like to, to, to give any kind of a messages or recipes for resolving the problems in the, in the remaining of our neighbor, neighborhood. Just to, to mention that two agreements we have signed with, with two of our neighbors, with Bulgaria and Greece, are a good example how with political courage and vision, even the, the, the very difficult uh, disputes can be resolved. These two accords are well balanced, not harming anybody anybody's interests, I mean, of the, countries involved and it should be it should be maybe the way forward for some outstanding issues being not still not being resolved in the region saying this I would like to to propose that uh, as many people are asking me what do you what do you have to suggest to the to the Serbia and Kosovo about resolving their problem uh, I would like to suggest anything because Prespa agreement by its content is very diff diff uh, different from the Kosovo problem <laughs> what I can uh, uh, suggest to our friends in Belgrade and in Pristina is only one sentence. Then do not uh, do not view uh, the end of your term in office, and do not view how you are going to get the second term or additional term in the office. Just see what is what is good for your country <coughs> and for the stability and prosperity of your people in the next 30 or 40 years. That's the best way. Because uh, agreements we have signed with Bulgaria and Greece are certainly not bringing us more popularity as politicians. So we are not getting more popular because of the PRESPA agreement. But that was necessary to be done for the next generations and for the brighter future of, of, of all people living in, in, in our country. Otherwise, we are going to be stuck in history and emotions and uh, thinking only how to fight with each other, not how to collaborate with each other, for the good cause, of course. What will be the most difficult challenge for you as a president of the Republic? And finally, what is the message from today's lecture? The message should be that each of us who would like to be in politics in the Balkans must be ready to cross over the ethnic and religious lines. Otherwise, you should stay at your home and watch politics eventually on TV because being in politics in the multi-ethnic societies, multi-religious societies, multicultural societies, as we all are, all, all, all are in the Balkans, <coughs> presupposes that you, are gonna, you should forget about your own religious beliefs, about your party political affiliations. You should believe in the principle that all people are equal to, are born equal and should be equal to each other throughout their lives, and in such a way to treat all of them. Otherwise, you will contribute only to, to, to the anxiety, to the hatred, to the violence eventually, uh, you are not contribute to calming the situations. And I know that that kind of polit politics is not making you more popular. But in my view, is it's better to be less popular but more efficient as a president or as a prime minister. Then anyhow, we are going to be for a limited period of the time in the office. Why not use all of that time, all of these years, for the, for the benefit of your people? instead of, of getting some tenders or doing some crime or for the benefits of your relatives or for some corruption and some of that. So we should, we should turn around the page whenever looking into the, into the daily politics. Thank you very much.
Now we'll ask the audience here if anyone has a question. Check doma kakšno vprašanje. A host has exhausted all questions possible. <laughs> so I'm not surprised that no one would like to ask questions. But I'm ready if anyone would like to comment. Yes. To comment, not only to question, why not? Maybe to criticize me. It's allowed to criticize yeah. the president, of course. Dáte celý svět rozumět, za co to ne? Můžeme zkoušet mi, až se něco otevře, protože jak jste, na kom stu, na kom stu, kdo se sada, na kom je vůli, u dohodu nima, nima u Evropské unii. Je, je jedno pojedan, nebo jaké? Jedno pojedan. Já jedno pojedan. Jel hoćete da vam odgovorim na vašem jeziku? Jel može na vašem jeziku? Ne, ovo što ste vi pričali nije slovenski. Ako vam je lakše da ne upotrebljavamo. Evo ukratko. Čekamo u oktobru ove godine da dobijemo datum za pregovore sa Evropskom unijom. Zašto i kako smo došli do tog stupnja? Mi smo implementirali ta dva bitna dogovora sa Bugarskom i sa Grčkom. Skoro da je najveći deo tih ugovora implementiran i sad s pravom očekujemo datum za početak pregovora. E sad, od tog datuma nadalje počinju muke. Crna Gora pregovara sa Evropskom unijom do sada već sedam godina. Ja sam rekao malo pre, možda ste čuli, još treba da otvore da otvore jedno od 35 poglavlja, a da zatvore ne znam, više od 20. A Ja mislim da je to nedozvoljeno dug period za bilo koju državu. Ako mi pregovaramo po 20 godina, koja je svrha tog pridruživanja i tog članstva? Generacije ima da porastu i da odu, čekajući bolji život. Či ja mislim da to ne treba da traje više od 5 godina. Razume se ako postoji volja za reforme kod zemalja kandidata i razume se ako postoji jasna politička volja u Briselu stvarno da nas prime. A ne samo da kažu vi ste deo Evrope. Mi smo deo geografske Evrope, ali da postanemo, bi voljeli deo političke Evrope, za to treba dvoje. Mi ovde da radimo to što treba da radimo, ali oni tamo da nas stvarno prime. Ne da pričaju duplo. Hvala. The new Greek government said publicly, and the new prime minister said publicly several times, that they would like to respect the PRESPA agreement. But allegedly they would like to be, and are going to be more rigid when overlooking the implementation of that agreement. We would, like to, we would like to see, as well, more rigid implementation of that agreement. We have nothing against that. We are in favor of that. You know why? Because the most difficult provisions or clauses of that agreement are already implemented. <laughs> the most difficult part of that PRESPA agreement was changing the name of the country, including domestically in our legal system. And we have changed the name of all state institutions. Now we are, and I am, the president of North Macedonia. So we are not afraid of more rigid implementation of that agreement. And even to the contrary, waiting eagerly to implement as soon as possible all provisions of that agreement. There are 20 provisions of that agreement. And in such a way to get closer to the European Union. So if they are sticking to the obligations their state, not the previous government only, but their state has taken. And if they are sticking to the provision that the PRESPA agreement has been ratified in the Greek parliament, with the needed majority, then agreement should be in place, and of course both, side, both sides should go towards full implementation of that agreement. Not to wait for decades and decades, but within a few years' time to implement the most part of that agreement. Please, your question. Please, pleasure, present. Um, this is Kambi, the Austrian ambassador. Um, you know that Austria, as well as Slovenia, is a fierce supporter of the EU enlargement and also of the opening of 
EU negotiations with uh, your country and as well uh, with Albania in autumn. We would have liked to see it already in June this year. Um, I ask myself whether you are also undertaking some efforts to convince those member states that are still skeptical um, to change their mind. Believe it or not, there is no any single European Union member country which is still skeptical about our case. I'm not speaking about the candidates of other countries. I would like all of them to be as soon as possible in the European Union. But speaking about the skeptical countries, there have been few of them, three or four, during the last year summit in Sofia in Bulgaria. No one or nobody is still skeptical about the North Macedonia accession talks. I have been just recently in Germany, visiting my, my colleague Steinmeier. He has persuaded me that Germany has nothing against opening the accession negotiations with North Macedonia. From in the meantime, from if we are speaking about the same countries, uh, in the meantime, from uh, Holland, from Netherlands, are not coming dissonant uh, tones. No one there is speaking. I'm speaking about the government and the, in the parliament. No one is saying that North Macedonia does not deserve to open the accession talks. And the same goes for France. The same goes for France. You have heard probably some reservations of some of these countries about Albania. Uh, and I would like to deal with that issue, of course. But about North Macedonia, there's no any, at, at the moment, there's no any single country saying clearly no for North Macedonia to start to open accession talks. Next question, Nastasia of Prashania. Okay, please. Ah. Please present. You are saying? Ružica Mladenovska, Makedonka i inače živjamo u Slovenija. Dokada je prošanje to so goce delče v Oborska so, misla v Oborska so goce delče so Bogarija. Slušam, da ka ima nekoj problemi in pogled to, što je podpišen dogovor so Bogarija za prijatelj. Na koj jazik sagaš da ti odgovor? Makedonski, slovenski, anglijski, kako sagaš? Ok, just for the rest of the people to understand. So we have signed that agreement with Bulgaria, as I said. We have the Commission of Historians on both sides, seven from Bulgaria, seven from North Macedonia. They have seven up to now, seven very successful sessions. But of course, as you might heard in the public, there are some problems, not only about Gotse Delchev and other national heroes for both sides, uh, but for some other historical events from some periods in the 19th, 20th century especially. And I have, uh, I have tried to, to intervene by, by, by giving an interview in the public, speaking about some of these issues. Uh, because there was a danger that the uh, Commission of Historians uh, might, might, start, uh, might, might stop functioning well. Because tensions within the Commission in the past several months have been on the rise. And unfortunately, politicians on both sides have not been putting a lot of attention to that. So it threatens to become a real problem. I have said something about that, not in order to resolve the issue because that was my job, but as a president of this country, of this part of the agreement, to say that historians there shouldn't succumb to the political pressure, which is obviously coming <coughs> from some parts, and should stick to the historical truth and to the historical facts. They're clear. It is true that there are, without dealing with a singular issue of Gosse Delchev or many other people being active in that period of the time, it is true, it is, a, it, it, is, it is a naked truth, everybody knows about that. There are many people in that period of the time on the threshold of the 19th to 20th centuries which has been active in the territories, territories of both states, now states. And that not only these two peoples, Bulgarians and Macedonians, but few other peoples in the Balkan region can consider them as theirs. My suggestion, not only to them, but to everybody, being in politics, is the, to all people, please do not deal with history anymore. We shouldn't exhaust ourselves with the ethnicity of Alexander the Grape or Philip from Macedon. We shouldn't speak about the mother and father of the people from 20, 20, 23 centuries ago, living in that period of time in the ancient Greece. We should speak about the future generations, about better life for our children, 
and it is certainly not to define the ethnicities of the people who lived in the 19th century. So find some solutions within the, that commission and let us to proceed towards the European Union membership because it's going to be beneficial for Bulgaria as well. For Bulgaria as well. If you have a prosperous neighbor, you're going to be prosperous as well, or more prosperous than having a, a neighbor which is producing uh, instability. We are running out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, if, if there is any question, I am here. I would like uh, to thank uh, President Dr. Uh, Stevo Pendarovsky for his interesting lecture, which will help us to understand better the current situations in North uh, Macedonia and also the future of this country and the region as a whole. We wish you country all the best and to you. And the end, I would like to invite you to join us out at our future uh, events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.